Everybody sit down. Ryan, sit down, find a place to sit. Okay. Okay. So, Barbara Oberman, take one. I was on holiday in Israel, and I met a lawyer who started to talk about it. And in the back of my mind, I thought, how terrible. And we came back to England. And then the following year, we made another trip to Israel. And he started telling us some of the stories about what was happening there. And Dov Sperling, if you know the name, came to England on a visit. And my eldest son, Anthony, took him to the biggest Jewish school in England to speak. Nobody was particularly interested in him. The lovely looking man, he was a great looking boy. Um, I think he enjoyed his visit to the school, but this made no waves and nobody was interested. And certainly the Jewish Chronicle didn't want to know. Do you want to know more? <laughs> and. I said to my husband, you know, we have to do something about this. And on another trip to Israel, I discovered that this lawyer had gone to the Soviet Union in 1969, 1970, and he hired a violinist because he was the only type of guy that could move around. I think he hired him. I, I never asked if he paid, but he said I hired a violinist. And he asked him to ask the different communities, did they want to be the Jews of silence or did they want us to make a noise? At that time, I wasn't part of the us. It was the world should make a noise. And he came back and said, absolutely, absolutely, all the Jews, wherever he went, really wanted to be Jewish, to live a Jewish life, and they wanted us to make a noise. And at that time, Geula Cohen, whom I didn't know then, wrote many articles in the Hebrew press that were censored. And I was on the periphery of all this, really just listening to what everybody was saying. And then she went to America and wrote, and this broke the censorship. And at that time I said, oh, there's no problem in England. The establishment will do it. And we were then, my late husband and I, he was a gabai of the shul, which means he was one of the big big white chiefs of the local synagogue. And I was involved with the Jewish National Fund and on the board of all the Jewish schools that the kids were at, all three were at Jewish schools. So we were entrenched in the Jewish establishment and I was convinced that Jews were suffering and reminiscent of what maybe had gone before and we had to do something. And I went to see the chief rabbi of England and he categorically said, that he could not ask the Board of Deputies, but I could. Sorry. Yes, is there a problem? Is that my fridge? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a noise from time to time. Can it's old. We, um, you... Yeah, yeah take, I, I don't know how you take the plug out. Sorry. You know what, what I just realized, I didn't have anyone say it. I don't know if it's true about you, I just don't blend with it. What? Um, Barbara Oberman takes time. Uh, not on. Okay, never mind then, we don't have time. Right. So come here, come back here. Did you know that Jews are not allowed to leave the USSR, and more importantly, that they want to leave the USSR? Truthfully, it, it hadn't entered my consciousness at all. There was a small group of students calling themselves the Student Struggle for Soviet Jewry that had a little line or two on page 16 of any newspaper, but it 
wasn't of any great interest to anybody in England, I don't think, at that time. And it hadn't really penetrated my consciousness too much until I heard, till we all heard about the Leningrad trial. And I must say, um, Silva was our heroine and what she actually said at the trial, we couldn't believe that she had this kind of courage. Uh, but it wasn't the impetus for the 35s, it was hearing about Raisa Palatnik in a dungeon that actually got us going. And that's how we got the name 35. Yeah. So, how did it change your life? I mean, knowing, realizing that there are Jews... Um... Totally. Absolutely, upside down. Um, we lived in a lovely place in England. It was called Golders Green. It was very, very pleasant. We lived a very pleasant life. These were easy, naive years in England. You could even make money. And there was very little social unrest that affected us at all. The kids were all at Jewish schools. They were very happy. One of them was very clever. He left the Jewish school and went to a, what is called in England a public school. But when I started asking around the Jewish establishment, and I once called a meeting of, I think there were over 30 people at this long table of the Board of Deputies of British Jews, and said to them, you know, now is the time. We are the Jews that are the they, and we did nothing in England for the Holocaust, and I berated my father that he didn't lay down in front of... Um, Downing Street to, to bomb the railways, we have to do something. And they were horrified. One after the other, the Central British Fund, the, the uh, Chief Rabbi's Office, they're the Jews of silence. You have to go away, bake cakes more or less, leave it alone. And it was a very disappointing meeting. It was a very nice man who was the secretary of the Board of Deputies called Albert Marx, which was the same name as a very famous comedian. But he was very nice, absolutely in charge and in control of this community, that uh, leave it alone. You have other things to do, leave it alone. And then I, I used to go to meetings to hear about anything to do with the Soviet jury issue, and then we heard about Reiser being in a... I'm sure you heard all this from the other ladies being in a dungeon, and uh, I said to my husband, you know, we have to do something for this woman, so it won't be these massive demonstrations, and maybe we won't get any publicity. She's my age, if my grandmother hadn't come to England, it could be me. So I said to him, let's do something, and I must have made about 150 phone calls, because each of the kids was at Jewish schools, Almost everyone to a letter said to me, do you have the agreement of the Board of Deputies of British Jews? And I, we called them the board. I said, no, we're just doing it for a woman. And in the end, we scraped together maybe seven or eight women prepared to do it. And later, two or three more sisters, cousins, brothers came. But there was never more at the beginning than 12. And we did a 24-hour hunger strike. That's an irreplay. Sorry, it's an airplane. Don't, 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 uh, don't, you don't stop. If something really bad happens, you will stop us. But you don't have to think about it. Okay. But if you already stopped, so we'll wait for it to pass. Uh, you actually finished the sentence, so that was good. Um, I, yeah, I already, I, I know, I, I like the fact that we covered uh, Raisa Palatnik. Um, but I want to go back to... Uh, the silver. To just, just your opinion, like, in general... Um, what were, there were uh, other refuseniks before, before the people from the Leningrad trial, there were other refuseniks that were on other trials and stuff happening to them. Why do you think the Leningrad trial was different? Why did this was the one? Well, first of all, they got the death sentence and this to us was absolutely terrible. Maybe if they hadn't, it wouldn't have woken the world up. I don't know. And they were so brave, <laughs> you know, it was, it was, it's, I don't know what it was. I don't remember other refuseniks or trials. I don't think we heard about them. I don't think we had a network in the Soviet Union giving us enough information. And certainly Israel was trying to dampen it down. Dov and Yasha went to America. 
And everywhere they went, because I met the people that had put on the events, before they got there, people said they were spies, so maybe one or two people turned up for every talk. But the Leningrad trials broke it open, actually. I remember you told me there was one demonstration, you had uh, people's name on you, and, and then... <laughs> yeah. Can you, can you the, tell me about it? Yeah, we were at... Um, we went to many demonstrations and we had bought our, made for ourselves these prison uniforms and I was silver. And one was for the motor show, where for the first time ever the Russians were going to show a car. And of course they're on foreign territory there, so they didn't know how to deal with us. And we weren't altogether sure we would get in. We never had invitations or anything, but we were dressed normally. And in England in those days, nobody asked any questions. If you looked halfway decent, they let you in. And we came into this motor show, and we were seven or eight. I have a picture of it there. And we took off our coats and lolled on the car. Now, there was a beautiful Russian girl in a bikini. They took no notice of her whatsoever, the cameras. There's one shot of her fleetingly running away from us. And we sat on this car with Silver Zalmanson and whatever. And the Russians would love to get rid of us, but they didn't know how, so they got behind me and they pushed me, quite hard, actually. And I went flying off this car, and that was the photograph. And then the next day, I didn't even tell my husband very much about it, but we were in bed. And the press in England goes to press about four o'clock in the morning, the evening papers, and the daily papers. And somebody called me that I'd become quite friendly with on the Daily Express, and he said, Barbara... You're going to be pleased. Silver Zalmanson's on our front page. I said, that's wonderful. Yes, but she looks a bit like you. <laughs> so we had a good laugh. We got up, and at five o'clock in the morning, you can go and get the papers from Fleet Street in England, and we saw the front page. But we were in all the papers, being chucked off this car. So do you remember when you heard that the death sentence was reduced... After, after eight days, they got the death sentence, and then it was reduced. Do you remember when you heard it? How did it make you feel? I mean... I actually don't remember. Sorry, sorry, I don't sorry, remember. Sorry, we were so involved. The most exciting meeting is the one your mother enjoyed most. <laughs> Anat, the most exciting meeting was the one your mother liked. When we went, when we confronted the ambassador. Yeah, we are getting to that. We are definitely getting to that. But I was curious because um, there was a death sentence. People in the world heard about it, was shocked, did demonstration, and then it was reduced. And you were part of the people who were. Demonstrating yeah, but we that didn't time? believe anything the Russians said. You have to know this. We didn't understand the system. We didn't know why. When we didn't consider they actually did anything terribly wrong, they took over an empty plane, they actually didn't get there. So to us, it was a little bit of a mystery what went on in the Soviet Union. There wasn't that much printed about it. Um, we knew the death sentence had been commuted, but they got these horribly long sentences, which was dreadful. But I don't remember ex feeling any great elation that this was... Uh, because we didn't believe them. I mean, did you feel like what you were doing is actually working? I mean, maybe the demonstration, did it make you...? Not really. Okay. I very rarely felt any elation because when one good thing happened, a bad thing happened. It was never kind of, oh, great, we can relax. Because we couldn't. Um, when, did you, when did you meet Silva for the first time? Silva was invited by the Board of Deputies of British Jews to do some demonstrations, and I asked if I could have her for a day, which sounds funny, but somebody had given me an invitation, and 
I was a bit stupid. I didn't do my homework. I thought it was the local communist association who were very against us, actually. There were a lot of them were Jews. They hated what we were doing. And they were the only people that caused me personally any bodily harm. The Russians were too scared. But anyway, I got this invitation. It was very smart. And I met Silva at Marble Arch with a few of my committee who were then boys, girls, men and women. It was the Committee for Release of Soviet Jewish Prisoners. And we, it was freezing cold. And I think she thought it was going to be a waste of time. And I didn't blame her at all because we marched down Park Lane. And Park Lane's a beautiful street. And this meeting was held in one of the most prestigious houses there. And I was quite amazed that it was there. And because I was still thinking it was the local communists. And I said to the gang, you stand over there on the other side of the road. And the police pushed them over there. And they started chanting, you know, one, two, three, four, open up the iron door. And I was dressed like Lady Dunabunk, and Silver was with me, and we walked in with this invitation. And we sat down. And I looked again at this invitation because it was a very smart crowd and a very sophisticated-looking crowd. Nothing like the crowd I was expecting. And it said it was the Great Britain USSR, which is quite special. And I looked around, and somebody said to me, the heads of all the Iron Curtain countries are here. But there was no press. It was a quiet... Unfortunately, there was no press. And Harold Wilson was the Prime Minister at the time, whom I had met, but I didn't know him at the time. And Ambassador Lunkov, who never came out to any of anything, he was there. I was getting a little bit nervous, and... Silver had wanted to present a letter to him for something that I didn't agree with at all, but I went along with it. She wanted conjugal rights. I thought, if she goes back to the Soviet Union, will we ever see her again? I was against it, but I didn't think it would ever happen anyway, so I went along with it. She was so terribly anxious to see Edward that I didn't have the heart to say, you know, mm, this, 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 this is not going to happen. And we sat there, and this Lunkov droned on and on and on about the state of the Soviet Union, and then Harold Wilson asked for questions. And God bless him, he quite liked women, and he caught my eye. And I was wearing this white fur coat that looked like mink, but wasn't in a big hat again, because you get noticed in a hat. And I smiled at him, and he smiled at me, and I put up my hand, but he asked the guy in front first to speak. And the guy in front asked, very carefully, everybody was being so careful, treading on eggshells with this ambassador, about the fact that British students were getting a very hard time in the Soviet Union, and the Soviet ambassador answered he would look into it, and they weren't getting a bad time. Heaven forbid he should agree, but, you know, they weren't, and everything would be fine. And then I put them on. And I thought, here goes, we're going to get thrown out. And I put up my hand, and I stood up, which the other guy hadn't stood up. It's very important, I think, to stand up. And I said, I want to ask you a question, Mr. Prime Minister, in three parts. If you say that at the beginning, they can't shut you up. Or it's difficult to shut you up. And the, the ambassador had said, because this noise from the crowd was all the time, you could sort of hear the chanting and the singing, that he wished he'd invited this raggle-taggle into the hall. I said, first of all, may I say that I'm part of the raggle-taggle outside and I'm glad you welcome me to the hall. And then I said, number two, I'd like to introduce you to Mrs. Silva Zalmans and Kuznetsov. Well, there was a gasp. And all these officials were standing there, and they're, oh. she would like to present to the Ambassador Lunkov a letter. And number three, <laughs> I tried to get it in. In World War II in England, Hitler's, what exactly did I say? Hitler's treatment of the Jews was foreign policy. Could you please explain to me and to us the Soviet foreign policy about Jews? Well, there was a silence. I, I, I was waiting for someone to march us out. So Harold Wilson stood up, and he looked small on all the pictures, but he's very tall. Before you answer, Mr. Ambassador, he put his pipe down. 
It was something I'd so wished it had been filmed. I would like to welcome Mrs. Silva Zalmanson Kuznetsov to the hall. I couldn't believe it. Neither could she. And I would like to tell you, Mr. Ambassador, that I am responsible, and I was, by this time, I, I wasn't listening very careful. I wasn't sure if he said 31 or 71, reunification of 71 families, personally responsible. And I was very much involved in her release. Couldn't believe it. And then the ambassador started to speak. We have no Jewish problem. And then he waved to three men, and they were like, if you can imagine the Knights of the Round Table, they looked like it, and they unscrolled this thing with all the, the statistics of what the Jews were doing. There were X amount of Jews in university, X amount of Jews could do this, and X amount of Jews could do that, and it, and it went on and on, and Silver was shaking and I was shaking. And then Harold Wilson, when he finally finished, he was very boring, he said, you, you would please bring the letter up afterwards. And on his way out, Wilson said to me, uh, I really have helped Jews, you know. I said, yes, and thank you very much. And then a little man came up to me. This was the funniest thing. While Silver was giving the letter, he said to me, how did you get in? <laughs> so I was completely out of it by this time. I said, through the front door. So he said, no, 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 no. How did you get in? And then I realized what he was asking me. I said, we had an invitation. So he said, that was one degree less than honest. And that was all. <laughs> we didn't get thrown out, and, but you couldn't if the Prime Minister of England invites you. So that was the occasion where your mum was, uh, where Silver was quite impressed with the British. Yeah, that's pretty, um, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> it was very theatrical, because how it worked out that the crowd was there and we could hear in the front room of this huge house we could have been upstairs way over there and the whole thing would have been but it was it was and it was so cold um Brian, do you have or do you want to ask her about uh, making coming to israel oh yes yeah. thank you okay so why did you made aliyah well my eldest son came to do a year as young people do and he signed up and he was in a war and then my second son said he was going to Israel and he was going in the army and that was it. So we made Aliyah. And it was a bit ridiculous to stand on the street corners of London and say they have the inalienable right to go home and we were sitting somewhere else. Oh, just a second. Be careful. The, the mic when you... Ah, uh, sorry. Can you sorry. say that again? So you were in the streets of London. And it was a bit ridiculous to say they have an inalienable right to go home and we were sitting somewhere else. Many, many of the Jews that I worked with, and the women and the men, made Aliyah. It was a very big impetus. I mean, it was ridiculous to sit in London, and uh, they were sitting in jail for years on end to go to Israel, and we could go, so we did. Quite hard work with my 14-year-old daughter, I might tell you, but we did. Do, do you have any, um, something uh, else you would like to say that you think is important? To the story? Yes, um, at the time we had um, the foreign minister, I, I've forgotten his name, he had the lovely quiff of hair and he came to make a speech to the Jews at the Zionist Federation. And I remember at the time he said, I don't understand, you make all this fuss for the Jews. There are Germans suffering in the Soviet Union, there are, I forget, he mentioned a few other ethnic minorities suffering in the Soviet Union. And I was very overcome with the importance of this guy. And I didn't say anything, but I thought to myself, you know, we don't have, we're very small, the Jewish race. We're a religion race, people. And with 14 million, I didn't have the energy to fight for anybody else. I didn't have the passion for fight for anybody else. And I'd like to think that the young people today would have a passion to help their fellow Jewish people if, if the need ever arose. How about the two that were not Jewish in the group? There were two people. Well, we did fight for them too. <laughs> but Can you say we fought for the non... I mean... We fought for the non-Jews in the group and the Jews, and we would have fought for the Jews, but... for the non-Jews, but 
not specifically for another cause, the passion that was aroused in all of us was because it could have been us. My grandmother came to London and it, it just could have been me. From uh, Rejitsa, uh, sorry. My grandmother came from Rejitsa, so did my grandfather, in 1900. And uh, we had a good life in England. They had a very hard time when they arrived. But had they stayed, this could have been me. Silver could have been me. I was this sparky dame that would have wanted to get out. So. How did people uh, react to the, the fact that they were hijacking her? Well, my brother, who's a professor of law, wrote a letter about it that this wasn't a hijacking as you know it. It was a hijacking as is known is when you take an aeroplane in flight full of people and you hijack it. This was never the intention of this Jewish crew of, your mo of Edward or Silver or any of them. And they had their own pilot. It was an empty plane. And it certainly isn't the definition of hijacking. And we wrote to all the newspapers, and it was printed in all the newspapers, our definition of what it should or shouldn't have been. And it's, it's a mistake to call it a hijacking, because it wasn't. How would you call it? A robbery. They wanted to steal a plane and get away. And it actually woke the world up. So. And though they were incarcerated, a couple of million came out. It was quite amazing. That the last, the last sentence was a good ending. I'm not sure if it was a couple of